Monday Thursday derives its name from the Latin verb mando, meaning to command. Its reference is to the Eucharist when Jesus says to his disciples and to you and me that we are to do this in remembrance of him. The twin foci of Monday Thursday are the Eucharist and foot washing. Because we cannot gather for Eucharist, and we have made the decision that we will not celebrate the Eucharist until we can all be gathered together, the emphasis this evening is on the foot washing, on servanthood, that as Christians you and I are called to serve one another. So as we gather in these times, let us just be grateful that God came to serve us so that we in turn might serve others. Now my tongue the mystery If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to thee, O Lord. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to thee are both alike. Dear friends in Christ, here in the presence of Almighty God, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins so that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. 
Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance and amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbors in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. The word of the Lord. He led them with a cloud by day, and all the night through with a glow of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness, and gave them to the impasse from a great deep. He brought streams out of the cliff, and the waters gushed out like rivers. But they went on sinning against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They tested God. Struck the rock, the water.
waters gushed out and the galleys overflowed. But is he able to give bread or to provide meat for his people? So he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them grain from heaven. So mortals ate the bread of angels. He provided for them food enough. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself. Then, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, Jesus said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, 
God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. In the holy name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. taken from the book of Exodus. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. It has come. Finally, it has come. The long vigil we have kept, working to build up the great cities of Pharaoh, the cities of Ramses and New York, of Boston and London and Milan and Beijing, that vigil of working and waiting and watching is now over. The plague has come. The night of the destroyer has closed in around us. Of course, there were weeks and months, years, really, when we did not see this coming, did not prepare or consider such things. We worked in Egypt, laborers on the great projects of a mighty power, building up slowly, brick by brick, the monuments of a stable and ambitious nation, and day by day the pyramids and office parks, the temples and schools and storefronts, the places of commerce, of leisure, of luxury springing up under our hands. We ate our fill then. Egypt was a land of leeks and onions, of flesh pots filled with every food the world could supply. It seemed unshakable, permanent and confident, like the very stones that decorated the plazas and museums and great halls of this rich land. Of course, we knew that in the midst of this opulence, some suffered, suffered greatly. While some of us lived in the palace of the great Pharaoh, others were little more than slaves, laboring at jobs that gave them no benefits, no leisure time, no security at all, but only the terrifying thought that they could not keep to the quota of bricks even bricks without straw, and would join that great army of the unemployed, the destitute. We saw all that. And even before the mighty prophet of God arose, we knew that we were knit in one fabric of destiny, and that a stark divide ran straight through the middle of Egypt, our own homeland. But still, in the midst of all that, we saw all of that that we saw. We could not believe that anything could shake this realm 
and shatter its confident expanse along the banks of the Nile. All that has changed now. For a time, the prophets in our midst with their charts and algorithmic projections and warnings like so many staves turned to serpents seemed matched by the deniers with their own secret arts. Perhaps the destroyer would come among us, but perhaps not. We were unsure then. But now that season of waiting is all over. It has come. And everything has changed. The mighty engines of world empire, of commerce and world trade, of international travel and tourism, of schooling at university and daycare, of government and medicine and houses of worship, all these have shuddered to a halt. And we do not know when it will all return or how it can. We now hear the cries of the Egyptians ringing out in the night the calamity in Italy, of the suffering who must die alone, the hospitals overburdened, the doctors and nurses desperate for supplies, the scars imprinted on the Chinese people, the roaring crisis in New York, and the lamentations raised over the sick and dying in Los Angeles, in Detroit and New Orleans, in Miami and Washington, D.C. We know the destroyer now, and he has brought the plague in his wake. And not just Egypt has been forced to reckon with the night. The small band of disciples gathered around their teacher that Passover in Jerusalem, tasted fear and destruction that Monday Thursday in the upper room. Long gone were the palmy days in Galilee when Jesus was approved by the crowds and everyone praised the words that fell from his lips. Long gone were the fresh disciples eagerly joining in with the Twelve in their adventure with this teacher and wonder worker. No one now was cutting through the roof to lower the sick down to be healed. No town crowding around the doorway to be taught or healed or told the way to in inherit eternal life. Long gone the Pharisees, such as Nicodemus, coming at night to be taught by Jesus, the scribes who were not far from the kingdom. No, this Passover, the night has come, and the destroyer is in their midst. Ahead lies only deeper conflict, harsher rejection, bitter words, bitter deeds. The disciples are truly alone in this upper room, the twelve with their teacher, and they must hear this night that one of them would betray their Lord. It seems there is nothing left for the destroyer to do. Fear is all around violent arrest and execution just over the next hill. Grief and uncertainty and defiance even among the inner circle. The whole great engine of preaching and healing and announcing the coming kingdom all shuddered to a halt. Jesus had spoken of his rejection and death 
before. But really, who could believe that? But now that love and light of the world, the beloved son seemed destined for nowhere but death. Then something wonderful happened. Breaking into that night of fear and grief, a wonder every bit as great as the mighty deliverance under Moses in that Passover long ago. Their teacher and Lord rises from the table, takes off his outer cloak, ties a towel around his waist, and kneels down before his own disciples to wash their feet. Jesus has become a slave, a slave in Egypt. He does the slave's work, washing and wiping and bending down before his disciples, even before the one who would betray him. That act of washing, so common, and now we see so vital to life itself, Jesus has taken for his very own. He will make this washing our way of life, our means of participating in him, of having a share, as did Peter and Judas that night, in the resurrection and the life who is Jesus Christ. The water that divided like walls to allow the Israelites to pass through on dry feet has now become the water that bathes and cleanses those, those feet, a washing that leads to eternal life. Jesus that night injected into the darkest pit of plague and fear, the love that is his own heart, his own humble service. Into death and fear of death, he has brought love, a love to the end, his own most bitter end. In our night, too, the Lord Jesus kneels at our feet, robed in his garment of a slave, ready to wash, ready to love, ready to be the means and gateway to life. This does not mean we will not sicken or die, nor that those whom Christ loves this dear world of his own making will not suffer greatly in this hour of pestilence and need. Even the ancient Israelites who escaped slavery by water that Passover night tasted hunger and temptation and death in the wilderness where Moses led them. But they knew as Christians have known since our Lord's death, so very near now, that blood on the lintel will save. Christ's blood, the lifeblood of love, will deliver us in our fear, in our uncertainty, in our sickness, and at the hour of our death, we are washed by that one slave in life as in death, we are his. So even in this night, we have everything to be grateful for, a rich thanksgiving to raise, because this one death brings life, and this one washing, eternal life. This is Christ's tender nearness to us this night, amid the cries and lamentations, can you hear his call, 
his water rushing into the basin, his love ready to illumine every dark place. Listen this night, for he is calling us. Fellow servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an act of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not by power, authority, or even by miracle but by such lowly service. We all need to remember his example, but none stand more in need of this reminder than those whom the Lord has called into ministry, lay and ordained. Therefore, I invite you who share in this ministry, the priesthood of all believers, to come forward that we may together recall whose servant we are by following the example of our Master. And let us remember by his admonition that what will be done for you is also to be done by you to others, for a servant is not greater than his Master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus Christ, after he had supped with his disciples and had washed their feet, said to them, Do you know what I, your Lord and Master, have done to you? I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall the world know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, 
When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Here ends the lesson.